Last week, we began a new worship series about the life of Moses. The purpose of this series is to explore his life from a scriptural and historical perspective, as well as how it speaks to our daily lives as people of faith. After all, while this is an ancient story, it has a lot to say about life in the modern world. For example, last week we learned that at the time of Moses' birth, the Israelites were being enslaved and persecuted by the Egyptian people. The motivation behind this injustice was fear specifically the fear of the stranger or foreigner, something we know as xenophobia. We also learned about two incredibly brave Egyptian midwives who stood up against the rising fear and hatred toward the Israelites. Their names were Shipra and Pua, and despite being commanded to kill every male Israelite child during birth, they conspired to help them be born safe and sound. These two women are examples of what the book of Romans calls philoxenia, which is the love of the stranger or foreigner. Unfortunately, xenophobia is far too common in the modern world. As a people of faith, we are called to push back against that reality by practicing philoxenia. In fact, according to the teachings of Jesus, the baseline for how we treat others is always supposed to be love. Anything other than that, is not reflective of our faith, and it should be challenged at every point. Now, despite Shipra and Pua's actions, last week's story ended in a tragic way. Upon hearing that his commands for them to kill the male infants was not working, Pharaoh ordered that every male Israelite child was to be taken from their parents and thrown into the Nile River. It is one of the most distressing stories in Scripture, and serves as another reminder of what can happen when xenophobia and the hatred it leads to goes unchecked. While this decree was in place, a woman named Jochebed gave birth to a baby boy. While she was able to hide him for three months, he eventually grew to the point she could no longer keep him hidden. So she came up with a desperate plan to save him. Carefully preparing a basket so that it would float, she took her son and placed him into the Nile River near the location where the daughter of Pharaoh went to bathe. Can you imagine? Her situation was so desperate that she placed her son in the same waters where other boys were thrown to drown in hopes that the daughter of the one who ordered their murder would save her son. As she bathed, the daughter of Pharaoh heard the boy cry, and she took pity on him. She took him out of the basket and saved his life. In time, she would adopt the child as her own son and name him Moses, which means to pull, draw out of the water. At this point, there is a big gap in the story of Moses. In fact, according to the seventh chapter of Acts, the first story told about Moses after he is pulled from the Nile took place 40 years later. In that first story, we are told that Moses went out to visit the Israelite people, witnessing for the first time their horrible conditions. As he watched, he saw an Egyptian man begin to beat an Israelite. Moses' anger boiled over, and after looking to make sure no one was watching, he struck and killed the Egyptian, and then hid his body in the sand. It's a shocking way for the story of Moses' adult life to begin. And while we might be tempted to justify his actions because of the injustice of the moment, we really should be pretty careful here. Scripture identifies the danger of Moses' actions in the very next sentence of the story where we are told that when Moses went out the next day, he witnessed two Israelite men fighting and he intervened, asking the one in the wrong why he was striking his fellow Hebrew. The man answered, who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? The man's response is pointed and intentional. Moses acted as ruler and judge over the man he killed. There was no due process. Even the Israelites, who were victims of oppression, knew this was wrong. Moses knew what he did was wrong as well. That's why he hid the body. Now, knowing others had seen what he had done, Moses realized he was in trouble. And he was. When Pharaoh heard what happened, he sought to kill Moses. So, fearing for his life, Moses flees into the wilderness. 
Let me show you our map once again. This is, this is where Moses went from that moment. Now, as a reminder, here's the Nile River. Here's the Nile River Delta. Moses was living in a place called the land of Goshen, which is here. He fled across the Sinai Peninsula and ends up in the land of Midian, which is located around here and is part of modern day Saudi Arabia. Here's a picture of the landscape. You can see how rugged and yet beautiful it is. Here, here's another picture. This is one of a modern day shepherd tending his flocks in that area. Now, not long after getting there, Moses sat down next to a well when some women who were sisters came to water their flock. As they did so, some men showed up and forced them to abandon the well so they could water their own flock. As Moses watched this, he became angry at the injustice of what was happening. If you're thinking this sounds familiar, you're right. Moses is feeling a lot like he did just before he killed the Egyptian. But learning from his mistakes, Moses intervened this time in a non-lethal way that drove the men from the well, allowing the women to continue their work. Now, it does not make up for his previous actions, but it does demonstrate a course correction. After returning home and telling their father what had happened, he said to his daughters, why'd you leave him there? Go invite him to dinner. They did so and Moses stayed with the family, eventually marrying one of the man's daughters, a woman named Zipporah. After some time had passed, Moses was out in the fields tending his father-in-law's sheep when he noticed something strange. A bush nearby was burning, but it was not being consumed by the flames. This is how scripture describes what happened next. When the Lord saw that Moses had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then God said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Moses did as the Lord commanded, at which, at which point God continued to speak. I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them. Then God called Moses to lead the people of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt. But Moses doesn't want to do it. He began to push back against God's will, giving what he thought were some good reasons for why he was the wrong person for the job. In response, God reassured Moses that those things could be overcome, and they would be overcome. God even named some specific ways in which that would happen. And so, even if reluctantly, Moses answered the call. Now, I want to take a moment here to point out a thread that is woven through the story of Moses so far. That thread begins with the two midwives, Shipra and Puah, and their courageous response to the horrible command to kill innocent infants. It weaves through Jochebed, a woman who hid her child and then with tremendous faith and self-sacrifice let him go in order that he might live. It picks up with the daughter of the Pharaoh who defied her father and rescued an Israelite infant, adopting him as her own son. And finally, we see it when Moses accepted God's call to go and lead the people of Israel. This thread is the example of people answering the call to serve others. And it reminds us of something very important. While God certainly can and does act in ways that impact our world, more often than not, the way God works in this world is through people. If any of the people in the story of Moses had refused to act as they did, there would be no story here. In order for any of this to happen, people had to get involved. Yes, God did some amazing things to help lead the Israelites out of their bondage in Egypt. But if it were not for a lot of people getting involved along the way, things would have likely turned out very differently. What was true in the ancient world is still true today. In order for our story to turn out in ways that reflect God's will for our world and for our lives, we've got to partner with God to help make that happen.
We've got to be willing to say yes to God's call and answer the call to go and serve in whatever ways that we can. While I'm pretty sure we all know this to be true, there are times when we could be a bit like Moses while he was standing at that burning bush, coming up with all sorts of reasons why God should choose someone else. I get that. I've done that. And while there may be times in our lives when we aren't able to do all that we'd like, more often than not, there is at least something we can do to say yes to God's call. And while we may not have the luxury of God calling out to us from a burning bush, I believe that one of the biggest ways God speaks to us is when something starts to burn inside of us, getting our attention and urging us to get involved and to do something to make a difference. Think about this for a moment. Have you ever experienced a time or season where there was something happening in the world around you that just felt wrong? that something felt broken or harmful, or something you just believed could be made better, that something had to be made better. Do do you remember that feeling? It's kind of like a burning inside of you. Sometimes the flame is small and not too hot, but other times its heat is something you simply cannot ignore, and you feel like if you don't do something, it's going to consume you. Maybe the spark that began to burn inside you wasn't because something was wrong, but because you discovered something for which you have a passion, something you love doing so much that even when it requires some sacrifice, it feeds your soul. Working with children or youth at a local school, serving at a local food pantry or shelter, delivering meals on wheels, coaching youth sports, or getting involved in the arts in some way. Whether it was one of the things I've just mentioned or something else, think about a time when you answered the call to serve someone else or our community and discovered a new passion that began to burn inside of you. Whether the source was something that broke your heart or something that filled your heart, I want you to think of a time when something lit a spark in your soul, urging you to get involved, to do something, to answer the call. That spark, that burning, is not all that unlike God's voice speaking to Moses from the bush in the wilderness. It is trying to get your attention, trying to summon you to the holy ground of calling, asking you to take off your shoes, to sit, and to listen to the invitation being made. An invitation to join the thread of those who have come before us in the story of our faith. People who said yes to the call of God and who helped make our world a better place. I wonder, what is God calling you to do to help make this world a better place? What spark is burning inside of you right now that might be the call of God in your life? What is it going to take for you to say yes? Of course, if there is any way our staff can help you discern that call or answer that call, we are here to walk alongside and support you. According to Ephesians 4, one of the primary roles of the clergy is to equip the saints for ministry, and we take that call seriously. Friends, like I said before, there is no doubt that God can and does work in amazing ways to help make our lives and our world better. But more often than not, God works through people. Of course, for that to happen, God's people have to say yes. May we be a people who do just that. May we let the spark of God's call burn within us so that we can let Christ's presence shine through us. For in so doing, we become the light of the world, shattering all darkness and bringing hope to all people. Amen.